Welcome to the Cloud Pod, where the forecast is always cloudy. We talk weekly about all things AWS, GCP, and Azure. We are your hosts, Justin, Jonathan, Ryan, and Peter. Episode 176, recorded for the week of August 3rd, 2022. The Cloud Pod earnings continue to be steady. Thanks, Foghorn. Good evening, Jonathan and Ryan. How's it going? Very good. It's going pretty good. Good, good. Speaking of Foghorn, Peter's not here tonight because he's on pre-scheduled vacation, which I I protested. I was like, you already missed how many weeks of vacation? Like, I don't, I don't know that you're allowed to take another podcast vacation, but uh, here we are. He said, I don't care. I'm going yeah, anyways. The, the unlimited time off policies not working in our favor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He took the uh, anti-work approach. He's like, well, if you don't let me take this vacation, I'm just going to quit. And I was like, okay, fine. You can go. Whatever. Fine, fine, Peter. You can go. So that's where he's at. Uh, but he's going to unfortunately miss the, one of the most important episodes of the quarter, which is, of course, earnings. It's earnings time once again from our cloud providers. And as we like to do every quarter, we like to look back at how the cloud teams did. Of course, uh, it's always a mix of their business and their cloud business. So we'll try to skip through the business part and just talk about the cloud part as much as we can. But uh, you got to talk about the whole story. Uh, Microsoft apparently had its slowest earnings in the last two years, hurt by a sharp slowdown in its cloud business, is the headline from Washington and, uh, or Wall Street Journal. Uh, Microsoft posted revenue of $51.9 billion for the fourth quarter, up only 12% from the prior fourth quarter. Net income on that $51.9 billion was $16.7 billion. I'm going to go cry that it's not more. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, outlook, though, for Microsoft was uh, still upbeat and expects sales of $49.25 billion to $50.25 billion in Q1, uh, which is the next this quarter we're currently in because they're on a weird calendar schedule. Uh, the most important part, though, is the cloud, and demand for cloud is still increasing, but at a more moderate pace. Microsoft, during the pandemic, had multiple quarters of 50% year-over-year sales growth. Analysts expected 43% growth year-over-year, but earnings are only or only a measly 40% growth. And for the quarter, it was about 28%. Microsoft reached $25 billion for the Microsoft Cloud Group, including non-Azure services, so don't get too excited. And income from that group was $8.68 billion. Ooh, let me just wipe the uh, the tears from my eyes with these $100 bills. That's... Uh... <laughs> yeah. I, and it's it's funny because like you know I don't want to cry for Microsoft, but then it's also like the tone in these these analyst articles about these earnings are so hilarious. Like they're just so negative. Um, like oh my god, they're forecasting down. Like yeah, yeah. well they, everyone's saying there should be a recession. So like what are you going to do? Are you going to say oh yeah, screw those guys? I don't know what they're talking about. No, you're going to see that there's headwinds in the market. There's a recession potentially coming, and you're gonna you're gonna guide yeah. down on your guidance. Like duh. <laughs> and Teams is a huge part of the cloud growth. Um, and so like the last two years have been, you know, companies figuring out how to remote work for the first time ever. And so that's not a sustainable thing. Like those two yeah. years growth is all just pandemic. Yep. Like it's like, oh, but they're they're basically losing money. Like, no. <laughs> I mean, I mean capitalism. I, de- I demand <laughs> continuous growth. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but net income is sixteen point seven billion dollars. No one's hurting. No one's hurting no. over there. They're very happy. You know, uh, I mean, unlike some of our other other providers here, who we'll talk about in a second, maybe a little bit more upset. But yeah, uh, Microsoft, you're good to go. Stop complaining. Well, speaking of Alphabet, uh, they are here with 69.69 billion dollars for the second quarter, up 13 percent from the prior year. But they are seeing a major pullback in their advertising revenue, uh, which is putting their forecast at the lower targets, impacting their stock, which was negative on the news. Uh, for our GCP uh, revenue, it was 6.28 billion dollars, a growth of 36 percent from a year ago. Uh, but their loss was still about 858 million, which was a slight climb in their loss from prior quarter. Uh, so they have not yet figured out how to make money on GCP, but they'll get there eventually, I suspect. But they really like that right now with the uh, ad revenue down. They like they like GCP revenue to kind of fill in the gaps for them, I think, but uh, <laughs> not quite there yet. And then, of course, Amazon Web Services rounds out the last uh, reporting earnings on Thursday. Uh, they posted a net loss for the second straight quarter due to their overbuild out of warehouse capacity and their terrible investment in Rivian, uh, which took a pre-tax loss of $3.9 billion dollars. Revenue for the period was up 7.2% from prior year at $121.1 billion. Uh, losses were $2 billion compared to an income of $7.8 billion a year ago. So that Rivian thing is really not working out for them. Uh, losses, were, of course, were higher than the analysts expected because they're bad at their jobs, as we'd like to talk about. Uh, but Amazon revenue, or AWS revenue, was the most important with $19.74 billion for the quarter with growth of 33%. And AWS income to the bottom line was $5.72 billion. 
which would normally evaporate all those losses that the store takes, but not when you have Rivian taking more losses than that. Yeah. I mean, I hope Rivian turns it around because I actually like the product, but you know, it does have to make money and make sense. Yeah. I, I also think it's really interesting that the year over year growth for all the cloud sectors is really close from, you know, 33% to 40% all within that range. Like that's pretty crazy. Yeah. It is very interesting. Uh, you know, everyone's going to the cloud though, right? That's the answer. Mm-hmm. Of course, all of this uh, bad news has meant that Google and Microsoft have all said they are starting to slow down their hiring plans and joining other notable tech firms like Apple, Netflix, and Meta, uh, which have all announced similar slowdowns as well. And then in Amazon's earnings, they also talked about uh, their slowdown, and they will be uh, they had a 6% drop in their total employee count, which when you have 151,000 employees, 6% is not as big of a number as you maybe think it is. <laughs> when you think about all the warehouse employees they have, uh, and they are also reevaluating hiring and staffing needs. So the recession that you know may or may not happen is definitely going to be a self-induced recession at this point if we keep not hiring as we were before, because there's just not as much money coming into the economy, coupled with high inflation and bad interest rates. It's just going to be a bloodbath at some point in the next 12 months, I fear. And then, of course, I did want to point out Oracle is also laying off thousands of people, <laughs> particularly to cut down to a billion dollars in expenses. Maybe they overinvested a little bit in those data centers. Uh, the, they did say in their earnings that their uh, TikTok revenue had increased their OCI revenue from 4% of total Oracle revenue to 5% of total Oracle revenue. So, you know, that's a that's a pretty big number and considering actually Oracle's revenue, uh, although they are saying that the OCI investment is hurting their free cash flow, which fell about $5 billion, which in a recession, cash is king, maybe not so great. So maybe we'll see Oracle uh, step back from maybe building quite so many new data centers. Yeah, I think in the, art- the article mentioned that the cuts were in marketing, which I'm all for just because of their, their silly ploys at reInvent. Uh, but then, you know, their cuts are in customer experience, which I think is a terrible idea for Oracle. So, well, so the customer experience product line at Oracle is their competitor to Salesforce. Oh, okay. So it's not an overall. Got yeah. it. Yeah. And their marketing team is lawyers. So, mm-hmm. you know, they're mm-hmm. just getting rid of some lawyers. That's all they're doing. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, that was interesting too. I, I thought that was, you know, they're kind of just admitting Salesforce is not not doing the best for them, uh, but yeah, having a competitor with that product. And, you know, someday I just expect they're going to buy Salesforce because, you know, Mark and Larry are such good friends, but you know, maybe they're too big for each other now. Yeah, Who knows? Yeah. It'd, be It'd, be a merger. It'd probably be a merger before it's an acquisition is my guess. With Google um, suffering from loss of ad revenue, I kind of wonder how that uh, same loss of ad revenue is going to affect Platforms like TikTok, actually, because since they're entirely ad funded. Well, do we feel that TikTok's revenue model is completely based on ads, or do we think it's about the data that they collect? Uh, <laughs> maybe a little bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> they might be a little bit more insulated than ad revenue than you realize, because yeah. I'm not entirely sure what they're doing with the data they have, but it can't be good. It can't be good. Those financials aren't public, are they? For TikTok? No, they're not publicly yeah. traded. Well, I mean, they, I mean, they might be publicly traded in. ByteDance is the parent company. They're a Chinese yeah. company. And I, 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 I don't yeah. know. I it's not one I've looked into beyond you know all the FUD that's out there about how they're stealing a lot of data, which could be true. I don't know. Because I, I know that if I say something and then I go to TikTok later, it'll suddenly show me a video that seems very similar to what I asked about or talking about. So yeah, <laughs> got to be spying, right? Anyways. Let's move on to uh, AWS news for the week. First up, the Global Accelerator now supports IPv6. And for those of you who forgot what the Global Accelerator is, it's basically a uh, fast CDN to optimize TCP IP to your uh, web application uh, or your endpoints that are publicly posed, exposed to the internet uh, all through the backbone of AWS. Uh, this is apparently very important for mobile networks who are adopting IPv6 very, very heavily. Uh, and provided through the Global Accelerator will now provide better network performance for your apps. Uh, this does require, of course, that you have an IPv6 supported ALB, as that's the only dual stack endpoint supported today by the Global Load Accelerator. But uh, I would not be surprised to see network load balancer and some of the other capabilities available to this later in the year. But right now, it's just ALB supported. Yeah, this is handy for, you know, there's a lot of applications and a lot of people running those applications that don't really want to care about IPv6, right? It doesn't make sense to, to sort of handle that complexity within a VPC specifically if it's a non-routable space. And so this is handy for those teams. But um, I just want to mention like a funny rabbit hole I went down because in the show notes originally there was a typo for 
the w- one of the methods being support is IP five only. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and so that was like that was a good like twenty minutes. And today I learned IP five is a real thing that was just never really released and um, suffers from the same thirty two bit limitations as IPv four. That's the reason why I never made it. But really, it's the basis behind all of VoIP and and um, a lot of streaming protocols. I was like, ah, pretty hmm. cool. So one typo, I learned a thing. I apologize for the typo <laughs> in the show notes. No, no, no. I'm better for it. No. You should you should then go down a rabbit hole like, well, is there an IPv3 and is there an IPv7? <laughs> like you could go down the rabbit hole quite a while for this. <laughs> yeah, that's that's destructive. I've I've learned to pull up before I get too deep. Otherwise, you know, I start missing other things. Next thing we know, Ryan's like yeah. writing the spec for RFC, you know, for IPv8. Mm-hmm. And he's writing the RFC spec. He's like, I'm gonna submit this to the IETF. And everyone's like, Yeah, okay, Ryan. Okay. <laughs> My kids are worried about that weird stranger upstairs, you know. <laughs> I was reading a, I was reading an article about Linus Torvalds, and he, uh, you know, he loves his new M1 or M2 based MacBook, and he's running Asahi Linux on it. And I was just thinking about like, yeah, his comment was like, Mac is the best hardware ever, except for the operating system. And I was just like, oh yeah, this is the mad crazy guy in the back mm-hmm. in the basement going, screw you and your your bad hardware BSD based operating system. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna run Asahi Linux on it. I'm like, what's Asahi Linux? Like, I don't know. No one knows, but he does. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just hilarious. Something that you probably have to work at a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna guess it's not the easy <laughs> Linux. It's it's no it's no Ubuntu or uh, Red Hat. Mm. You know, the global accelerator. I kind of wonder really what the um, the bandwidth or the latency improvement is to use for global accelerator versus uh, just the just the internet. Because I mean. From from the consumer perspective, I would imagine most of the bottlenecks are between your device and the ISP, and not actually in those massive chunks that, that span the country. So you, you still kind of suffer from that first mile kind of. Well, I think that's the big advantage, isn't that the advantage is the peering that you get from Amazon? Like, because most of those network ISPs are going to be directly peered with Amazon. And so I, th- I think that's a huge part yeah. of it. I mean, I mean, this is the same play Akamai has been making for decades with their accelerator technology that they put on top of the CDN that you know, you're using Akamai's backbone to connect to them. And so this is a similar service to that capability. Yeah. And it does it does have some imp- performance improvements and more stability and less jitter in the connection. But it's is it a massive improvement? No. But it, you know, yeah. people who like it, like it. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, mean, I, I guess the, like the 99th percentile figure may maybe you may get more consistency even if you don't get a huge difference for most of the time hey, it's way easier than than actually transforming my app to not require 2700 calls for a login session so. <laughs> yeah you can do that <laughs> mm-hmm. works like a champ all right well i have a hashi corp story that i i was checked into aws here because it's all about the cdk and really that's just an aws thing but uh, the ga or general availability of the cdk for terraform solution is finally here uh, this will allow you to write Terraform configurations either TypeScript, Python, C Sharp, Java, or Go, while still benefiting from the full ecosystem of HashiCorp Terraform providers and modules. Uh, this effort was started over two years ago in collaboration with AWS and CDK team, and I was shocked that, that was two years ago because that felt like yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> uh, since the preview, many organizations have adopted CDK TF, and they have learned from early adoption how important improved tooling and core workflows helps their business. Uh, with the CDK TF 0.12 release, which is the latest version. It's not 1.0 for this GA, by the way. Not 1.0. <laughs> uh, the latest version includes several new features in addition to the GA, which one of those was support for Go, which uh, they just talked about. And then GitHub Action for deploying with Terraform Cloud, so you can integrate your GitHub workflow and drive to Terraform Cloud. Extended unit testing support to make sure your CDK is not going to write terrible code. Support for Terraform iterators, improved convert commands to convert from uh, you know whatever language to uh, CDK and many bug fixes and other minor enhancements, which you can find out full details of in the full change log, which was quite extensive. But uh, that's the big highlights of CDK TF 0.12. It's funny, yeah, because there's no way that CDK for Terraform has been around for two years and it was already like five years too late from the last time I needed it then. So, <laughs> like, starting to date myself and complaining about where was this when I needed it. Yeah, time's been a bit weird for the past few years. You know, we have BC and AD. I think we need like PC for post COVID now. So <laughs> let's just start start the clock at zero again. And <laughs> yeah, that's very true. I was thinking. I, like I, yeah. I, I was thinking earlier when I was said you know the show title and it was August third, and I was like August. How's how's that possible? It's still <laughs> it's still February twenty twenty in my brain. Yeah. I can't yeah. I can't relate. Yeah, we're only shutting down for three weeks. <laughs> Remember. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the three weeks is going to be up See you in two weeks after this craziness <laughs> is over. Yeah, yeah. Still waiting. Still waiting. I'm sure my desk is still waiting at that company, too. Like, Here, come on back. Just come on back. It's fine. Uh, Amazon Open Search 1.3 uh, was shipped this week, and they have given us uh, several new things and several articles. So I'll summarize them all down to this one big article. Uh, this new capability in 1.3 gives you visualization for advanced log and application analytics. Customers can benefit from enhanced log monitoring support with a live tailing of logs, the ability to see surrounding log data, and the ability to power to do powerful ad hoc analysis of unformatted log data at query time. Before this release, developers managed observability data from multiple apps and no insights into their application context. But now, with the new app analytics interface, customers can bring those logs, metrics, and trace data under a configurable app context. This simplifies the correlation and analysis of the data points. Log tailing is, of course, a great option for developers to monitor logs real time while debugging. And this is now in the console without having to refresh the view at all. Uh, there's also additional enhancements to the PPL language, which is the querying method you use for open search. Uh, this will allow you to define your own schema when querying the index, allowing them to improve indexing time and provide better presentation flexibility. Plus, a new order by and in clauses, which give you the ability to query multiple indexes using comma separated values using the PPL and the ability to change data types using the cast function in PPL. There's also now a continuous mod- mode for transforms, but those continuous mode is I mean, scheduled, which was a little weird to me. And then, of course, cluster metric monitors for you to determine several dimensions, including CPU usage, JVM memory, and total number of documents coming into the cluster, and a new detector validation when setting up new anomaly detectors to see if you would detect anything before you hit submit, as well as they now support GP3 volumes, finally, for your open search service. Yay, better performance at a better price. Yeah, I was really surprised it didn't launch with GP3 support since that was out before open search was or you know, the, the, the Elasticsearch offering. Um, but that well, pipe processing I'm... language is um, is is a really quite a big deal because it solves a huge problem, which people used to have. Like if, if you just hadn't indexed something in stored st- stored data, um, then you wanted to query it later, it was a real chore. I mean, it was a full text search effectively and nothing, nothing more. So this gives you the, the real ability to go back and um, sort of index on the fl- index on read basically, which puts it in the the sort of Splunk category of functionality, which solves a lot of people's pain points around Elasticsearch. I mean, you'd probably still have to ingest the data a specific way, but yeah, it's. I mean, it it does for me. It just really you know play taps for Elastic because this is the power of open search and the open source development of it. These are features that customers want the ability to group your app app data without having to like do like these complex queries and uh, restructure your log output so that you're including, you know, application identifiers in that statement. Like this is, these are amazing features for usability and not seeing any of this type of feature being released as part of Elasticsearch 8.0. So this is pretty, you know, pretty powerful stuff and does not bode well, (laughs) which, you know, not a surprise, but I think it clearly shows you know where open search is going to be heading versus where Elasticsearch is heading, and you're going to see that them get further and further apart as they continue down this path. Where Amazon saying, "If this is really an observability tool, we need to make it work like an observability tool that can scale," versus Elasticsearch is trying to be jack of all trades. Still, I mean, it's just funny because like you read through the release docs, and it's sort of like they're still working on how to make you know the internal internals work better you know there's improvements on system indexes and these things things that aren't really directly benefiting their users until they break mm-hmm. right well, i mean just having cluster metric monitors how many times did we talk about that with elastic <laughs> right. search and be like well what's the jvm memory like well you we had to run this like super complicated query to the console then you had to like you know pass that through a java handler and like you get something eventually or or how many number of documents are coming into the cluster like i don't know like yeah. what's in the sqs queue like, you know, like, okay, well, there's there's 12 million messages over there, so how many is it processing per second? Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, well, no, it's, it's processing events. It's not really the documents. The documents, you got to look at somewhere else. The messages could be, you know, other things, and so you got to do this. Like, that could be many documents, you know. Like, ah! Yeah, no, I mean, like, but, like, just the fact that they gave you that. But, I mean, even, I think a couple months ago we talked about here on the show that they had really released some tools to help you tune Elasticsearch, or open search in this case. Yeah. Uh, and it was like, well, you know, why couldn't Elasticsearch provide you tools to help tune it? Like, why did right. it have to take a third party to say, hey, you know, like this is hard to do, and you have to have be kind of a PhD in Elasticsearch and and all these things to figure out how to tune a goddamn thing. And so let's just give you a thing to do it, and make it easier for you. Like, thanks, thanks, David. So why did you have to do that? Mm-hmm. I, I'm 
the more open search matures, the happier I am with this decision to fork. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. I still don't want to use it, but I'm happier <laughs> with the decision. <laughs> I wouldn't discount it quite so quickly. It's still too much like Elasticsearch, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, the scars for Elasticsearch still run pretty deep. So I'm not, I'm not ready to commit to this again or to try it. But, you know, maybe five years from now, I'll have forgotten, like, you know, like how, how uh, after you give birth, you forget the pr- pain of that. Apparently, that's a woman thing. I don't understand. Uh, but yeah, maybe it's the same thing. I'll, I'll forget about the pain of Elasticsearch in five years. It's too soon. Yeah. Well, the last time they told us to log into a, you know, the, the the container that had Elasticsearch running and install some tools so we could get the debug information out. Like, no, that's that's <laughs> not that is not how we do <laughs> we do things. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you quite understand like modern yeah modern software like ad- administration. I guess yeah because it's yeah these are these are uh, cattle not pets and I don't even know how to log into it. <laughs> like it better emit data or it's gone. Yep. Well, if you're one of the five people who uses Neptune database from Amazon, uh, you can now support global databases, allowing a single Neptune database to span multiple AWS regions. The Neptune global database provides better fault tolerance in the case of region-wide outages, and they enable low-latency global reads for applications with a global footprint. Neptune global database uses a fast storage-based replication across regions with latencies typically within one second, using dedicated infrastructure with no impact to your workload performance. And in the unlikely event of a regional degradation or outage, <coughs> USC one, hold my beer. Uh, <laughs> one of the secondary regions can be promoted to full read-write capabilities, and you can have up to five second secondary regions with a global database, and each secondary region can have up to 16 replica instances. So uh, for you, who, those of you who need Neptune at scale, this is a great solution for you. I continue to see a so slow trickle of, of apps, you know, that are providing GraphQL APIs, and, and you know, so I, I can only imagine that, you know, usage of Neptune is, is growing. And especially in a, a service, you know, where yeah, you're you have a global footprint, and you don't necessarily want to rely on a centralized region or manage the traffic within that region. This is a great thing to have. So, yeah, I'm still yeah. in Hippieville on this. I'm like, okay, first you gave me relational, and then you gave me documents. So weren't documents; they're just JSON. <laughs> and then you gave me you gave me a columnar because that was a thing, and now you're giving me graph database, and I don't know what that means. So I just imagine <laughs> that you're just uploading, you know, graphs up to the up into the right into a database, yeah. and yeah, you know, that's what I think it is. And I'm going to continue to believe that way until I have to force to use it, which will be someday. I just haven't got there, so I'm sure there's more than five users. It is kind of a terrible name. It is a bad name. I'm sure there's a math term behind the name, but like the yeah, I always think of yeah pie charts. And- yeah, that's, that's no, my, my brain immediately goes to that. I'm like, why do you need yeah. a database for pie charts? Like, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I know I know it's more complicated than that. I just I, I haven't had yeah. a situation where I've had to implement one that I've had to learn the intricacies of it. Like I had to learn columnar, I had to learn Mongo and how Mongo's terrible. I haven't had to do all that yet. Oh, or, or Cassandra, a key value. <laughs> that was a good one too. Uh, I mean, do you want well, like the, do you want like the three sentence explanation that, that makes it click in your brain? Sure. Yes. If you have one. If if not us. Three, our users. Three, three sentences. Maybe I overcommitted with the three sentences. <laughs> <Nah>. so, so. <laughs> and that's an example of a graph database, folks. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I have to say about it. Well, so, so in, in SQL Server, you have primary keys and, and foreign keys, and you build relationships between tables. But there's yeah. only one uh-huh. type of relationship. In a graph database, you can define different types of relationships. So you know, if um, uh, you have different entities, whether it's people. Or, or vehicles or something else, you can define different types of relationships between those entities and, and they're indexed separately. So when you do a query, you can say, well, find me all the people who also own a Tesla. Find me all the people who fall in, who have these relationships with these, with these other things. So it's, it's, more like, um, it's more like sort of a, like a brainstorming diagram and you have edges to the graph. Okay, so... Entities are all kind of connected together. Yeah, so I don't know if that was three sentences, but um, uh, well, it wasn't. It could have been if I thought about it long. <laughs> uh, so, so let me let me try to play this back to you, uh, Professor. Uh, so, if I had a normal relational database, I would have a table of people, and I would have a table of cars, uh, and you know the manufacturer and the model would be in that table, and the people would be my name and my email address and my car type, and that would be a primary key that's linked through a foreign key relationship between those two tables. And I would say, okay, if I want to 
If I want to figure out the Teslas, you know, who owns the Teslas, I would do a left outer join from the car table to the people table, and I would get a query back that would probably not perform well because left, left outer join queries are not great performers. Uh, and that, but I would get an output of that that would answer this question. And so what you're saying is that you shouldn't do it that way. You should use this graph database because the graph database understands all those relationships better. Is that, is that essentially what you're implying to me? Yeah, it's, it's easier to, to find out how different entities are related using a graph database than anything else. Okay, I'm going to take your word for it. I, <laughs> I get it, I think, but I, I'd have to see a practical example. So <laughs> I think I'd have to design a structure. Your car, your car limitation, like, like it's almost like you're like, I need a couple more dimensions, I think, and then I think I'll understand your problem. It's, it's basically when I'm doing a, a multi-part join across multiple tables that SQL falls apart. And so what you're saying is that this is a solution to that problem. But your analogy, I think, fell short. I yeah, need it probably more, did, yeah. I need more data points to make it make sense to me. I'll come back with a better explanation next time. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned to a future episode for Jonathan Does a Thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, uh, for those of you who do want to learn more about graph databases, uh, Amazon has a new skill builder capability for you to go get uh, access to over 500 courses uh, plus new learning experiences to help you learn things at graph database. Maybe this is what I'll do. Maybe I will go try this and I will try to go use the Neptune uh, course if there is one. I hope there is. <laughs> but the AWS skill builder. Oh, just put it. Just put it on camera. It would be so fun to watch. <laughs> I'm sure it would be. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll log stream it. <laughs> AWS Skill Builder individual and team descriptions are now available from AWS. This is a new way for you to learn about cloud technologies and get practical experience with hands-on training. The foundational level courses are, of course, available online too for free, but the new subscriptions will give you access to a range of exclusive content to advance your cloud skills and prepare for AWS certification exams with self-paced digital training. The subscription can get you access to over 500-plus courses plus four new learning experiences. Those experiences are... AWS Builder Labs, which is a hands-on guided exercise to develop practical skills for common cloud scenarios, and you receive a sandbox AWS account for the duration of the lab, and there's no need for you to use your own AWS account and risk accruing unwanted charges. Hmm, I wonder why they did that, because people complain about it all the time. <laughs> they also give you step-by-step -step instructions to go through a typical cloud scenario, and it goes from a simple task such as configuring S3 to host a static website to more advanced scenarios such as developing a serverless web app leveraging DynamoDB. There are over 100 labs available in the Lab Builder today, with more coming soon. Next up is the AWS Jam, which gives you a clue, which gives you clues to guide you to solving real-world open-ended problems. No step-by-step -step instructions here, just hints. There are two types of AWS Jam, AWS Jam Journey and AWS Jam Events. Events are exclusive to team subscriptions. I once started the Jam Journey is available for several months to give you time to complete the challenges at your own pace and schedule, while a Jam Event will be set up by a team which can create events where teams come together at certain dates and times to solve challenges and compete with each other. AWS Jam events provide over 140 plus challenges across different domains. And then the third one is the Cloud Quest, which we are still in a Cloud Quest. We talked about it previously. I still don't want to talk about this anymore because it's not good. But apparently they have bundled this in for your subscription price, which was free before, so a little bit of upcharge there. Uh, and then the most interesting one is the AWS Certification Official Practice Exams. And you may be saying to me, Justin, wait, those are free already. Uh, but in addition to the, the free 20 question practice sets that you get available, if you're subscribed to the Skill Builder, you'll get uh, individual or teams can prepare for the AWS certification with new exam prep courses that include practice materials and a full length AWS practice exam that looks just like the main one with different questions to really give you that feel of pressure. You can have uh, you know someone yell at you if someone walks into your room uh, <laughs> if you're doing the virtual thing. Uh, this is actually priced quite nicely. This is $29 a month uh, or $2.99 for the year. Which uh, compared to other solutions out there, you know, you have to pay only annually. So this is a, quite a nice savings. Uh, if you're looking for a team subscription, for the uh, you know for teams for over 50 people, it's 4.49 per year for your first 100 people, and then it scales down to 2.99 for the next uh, thousand, and over a thousand is only 149 dollars a year per person. So uh, they're getting into the A Cloud Guru business, is how I see this. But uh, pretty nice offering, I think, for 29.99 a month for individual two. Yeah, I wonder if they use like the fault injection simulator to, to randomly reboot your machine or turn off your camera and stuff during the uh, the practice test just to give you a full experience of the of the proctored exams. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you guys want to sign up for the CloudPods virtual proctor, we'll just get on camera and stare at you uncomfortably <laughs> while you take the practice test. I you know, jokes aside, like I, I do like the way that they're presenting a lot of this training. Like it's I, I don't learn well myself in a classroom setting. Um, and so like I, I learn by doing, um, so any kind of hands-on labs or, or the jams, which I've done in person 
at like reinvent um those for me are, are way better for me to learn like the ins and outs and intricacies of different services so i love this you know and it doesn't really seem that expensive i was expecting you know a much higher subscription price per year for 100 people so pretty cool yeah, it gives you a it gives you something to, to work out. It gives you a problem to solve while you're trying to learn because learning from documentation really sucks. Mm-hmm. I know I know I I learn much better by by having a challenge to solve and, and figuring out the documentation along the way. Yeah. It just sort of gives you some context to the information. I think this the learning is part and parcel with the amount of swearing. Like I think that's part <laughs> of what my brain like that's how it locks it away. Because unless I'm frustrated and hate something, then I'm not learning anything. So you're learning all day then. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that yelling is. Hold on. (laughs) Have you been waiting months and months to hire your new AWS, GCP, or Azure architect, only to have them be poached at the 11th hour by a startup with a juice bar? Initiative stalled because you're having trouble hiring? Well, I have a simple solution. Falcon Consulting. Falcon Consulting provides top-notch cloud engineers to the world's most innovative companies and can be burning down your DevOps and cloud backlogs as soon as next week. Falcon certified AWS, GCP, and Azure professionals are armed with infrastructure as code and from day one will be designing performant, optimized cloud-native or hybrid environments that deliver on the promise of cloud. Their FogOps solution even provides on-demand cloud engineering to augment your existing teams. Visit www.foghornconsulting.com or send an email to cloudtalentnow at foghornconsulting.com and tell them the CloudPod sent you. Your dedicated FogOps team is with you for the long haul, and they bring their own juice. All right. Well, if you are uh, struggling because you don't know Python <laughs> to write AWS config rules, uh, they now have a new solution for you, which is the AWS config rules uh, writ- can be written now through AWS CloudFormation Guard. Users with limited programming experience can use Guard to define and review custom policies that check your resources have desired configurations. AWS Config Rules are a way of creating and implementing compliance policies against resource configurations. And currently, AWS Configure, Config offers both managed rules, with a, which AWS builds and maintains to meet common compliance use cases, and custom rules, which users create to meet their specific compliance needs. Guard is an open source tool offering policy as code, such that users can define policies to, prov- to validate JSON or YAML data using a DSL. Previously, to create a custom rule, you had to define a Lambda function, typically in languages such as Python or Java, and now you can author AWS config rules using Guard DSL without needing to develop AWS Lambda functions. Security and compliance managers have a simpler way to write custom logic, which reflects the compliance needs of your organization. Yeah, I don't really see the programming language as the big barrier to entry here, but like the it's just setting up the whole ecosystem to get it to work, right? Like it's you can't write custom rules. What you can do is write something that'll trigger your custom invocation of a Lambda. And you, you know, whatever's in that Lambda will, does the analysis. And it's very clunky if you want to evaluate a condition that's outside of those managed rules. And so this is, you know, a good step towards, you know, security engineers and, and other people which may not be, you know, full-time developers being able to, to contribute guardrails and safeties to their ecosystem. I kind of wonder what the justification was for building a separate tool for this when there are plenty of other good tools out there for, for writing um policy enforcers, the open policy agent, there's, there's, there's open source and commercially available tools that can do the same thing, basically. So why? Well, Guard is open source. Yeah. But, they're, lever- well, they're leveraging an open source thing. Yeah. Why I don't make know. another one? I don't know that they did make another one, is my point. Like, I'm not real hmm. sure because I haven't used this, so I'm maybe talking out of turn. But, like, it, the, I'm not sure if they made another one or leveraged a previously existing open, you know, open source implementation of policy and hmm. then just sort of plugged it into their service. I can't, I don't really know. Yeah, fair enough. I hope they didn't write another one though, because you're right. If they did like, sweet, like, come on, can we just fix one of the 19 that we already have that all kind of suck? <laughs> <laughs> and then our final AWS story, uh, AWS is announcing the general availability of licenses included visual studio software on EC2 instances. You can now purchase fully compliant AWS provide licenses of visual studio with a per user subscription fee Amazon EC2 provides pre-configured AMIs of Visual Studio Enterprise 2022 and Visual Studio Professional 2022. You can now launch on-demand Windows instances, including Visual Studios and Windows Server licenses without long-time licensing commitments. I guess no code isn't going to be a thing that soon then. (laughs) (laughs) Nope. 
Yeah, it's a little little interesting. I was trying to figure out the use case on this. I was thinking maybe it has to do with terminal service licenses, but then that doesn't make sense to me because that'd be part of a workspace announcement. So I, I guess if you're running Visual Studio, the full software package on EC2 instances for some development purpose, this would make sense the way you need that. And it could save you some money if you don't leave it on all the time. So maybe it's beneficial. Yeah, I suspect there's some .NET or C Sharp or ASP stuff that this makes a lot of sense for. And my my non Windows development land, I don't get this at all. But I'm sure it makes sense. As the as the honorary SME for Windows of the Cloud Pod, uh, I also do not know why that is. So this is even in my my black box of Windows knowledge. So uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't get it. But uh, it definitely seems. Uh, you know, like something that could be valuable for somebody. Just make sure you implement it properly. Let's move to GCP. Uh, so uh, you no longer have to write your own pipelines for data ingestion from PubSub into BigQuery. And as the headline says, no pipelines are needed, <laughs> which is nice. Google is introducing a new type of PubSub subscription called BigQuery subscription that writes directly from Cloud PubSub to BigQuery. The new ETL path will be able to simplify your event-driven architecture and for PubSub messages with advanced preload transformations or data processing before landing data into BigQuery for like PII observation, they say you still have to use Dataflow. So it doesn't help you in that scenario, but if you just have a path from Cloud PubSub right to BigQuery, uh, this is a great way to do that without doing some heavy, uh, you know, some heavy lifting that is not differentiated from anybody else. So it's an ETL path with no transformation? Just Correct. Yeah. <laughs> There's no T in that EL. It's just, uh, yeah. But you know, if you're just trying to take data and put it into BigQuery, and you yeah. already are, you know, you're already putting the data onto the bus that's already transformed, then you know mm-hmm. this is nice for you for that use case. I can see tons of use cases this enables for you, uh, and maybe in the future we'll see additional options. Oh yeah, no, 100. percent Because this is always my frustration when I have to set up like a workflow like this, and I just I have to put an ETL pipeline in place just to get data from A to B. Like, you know, it it's cumbersome and if I it's no longer needed it's great and if I need to put an EL, you know a transform layer in there I can still write a pipeline it still works just don't have to so great ad uh, so if you were you know super excited with that skills builder on AWS and you were like I really want a certification too but I use GCP uh, the new professional cloud database engineer certificate is now generally available and available for you to get tested on today This new certification allows you to showcase your ability to manage databases that power the world's most demanding workloads. Traditional data management roles have evolved and now call for elevated cloud data management expertise, making this certification especially important now because 80% of IT leaders note a lack of skills and knowledge among their employees. The Google Cloud certificates have to be proven to be critical for employees and businesses looking to adopt cloud technologies. And this certification has amazing things in it, including uh, create and manage cloud spanner databases, manage Bigtable, uh, migrating MySQL data to Cloud SQL using a database migration service and managing Postgres data, SQL databases on Cloud SQL. Uh, so that's uh, that's there for you. No SQL server mentioned on any of this, but if you have, use any of those three databases, Spanner, MySQL, or Postgres SQL, uh, this might be a good training certification for you to prove that you are skilled. What, no graph database? Come on. I don't think Google has a graph database. <laughs> no, there's only eight people and they're all using Neptune. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it makes sense to to help train people away from having to be admins since we're using managed services now and and help sort of hone their skills on how to do migration successfully and how to design scalable and available solutions which will run in the cloud and things like that. So yeah, it's 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 good. I think there's only certain aspects though that get replaced, right? Like there's a ton of data, you know, SME expertise that you can apply when interfacing with an application and that. So it's it's literally the, the the DBA administration test that no one does or does well, right? Like it's the the care and feeding of the individual servers and I don't know. Do they do they still have to run vacuum? Is that how old my data? I have no Yeah, that's that's a Postgres thing. Yeah. Mm. You know, like those those maintenance sort of items. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess you got to you got to give DBA something to do. Now they're not spending, you know, 5 weeks spinning up a SQL server on request. It's just an API, an API call. All the extra time I have. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to figure out how to enable, you know, high high performance read disks to these managed services. But teach them PyOps, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, that's what I would do if I was designing a course. Like, how do I make this course make me more money? Oh, yes, I'll design <laughs> PyOps into it. Perfect. And all the DBAs will well, immediately <laughs> take it. Like, I'm certified. 
Yep. And I need PyOps because my yeah. certification said so. Yep. That's how that go down. Give me all your monies. Yeah. Well, one of the things that is not apparently in the certification but is also important is that preventing data breaches is an important priority when creating and managing database environments. And ensuring user and app passwords meet high security standards is crucial for reducing risk and helping to achieve compliance with best practices and regulatory standards. To address those concerns, Google is announcing the general availability of a local user password validation feature for Cloud SQL Postgres and MySQL. It allows you to set up password rules for your local database users and help better secure your databases. Basically, Cloud SQL integration with IAM allows you to set up authentication to the database via IAM, and this is for those systems that don't leverage IAM to be able to authenticate, and now you can enforce password complexity policies on top of all of those local user accounts. But uh, they do mention that IAM is their preferred method and the way they say you should do it uh, because of the temporary token nature, but if you do have a legacy application, local database users may be your only solution. Yeah, I hope that feature actually bubbles back up into the open source, uh, open source versions of those databases because it's a feature which is i mean it should exist well i think they do exist uh but the the challenge with a lot of these managed services is they don't let you set those parameters to your company's policies and so if you like google's version of it then you're fine but as soon as google's version doesn't meet your requirement you were kind of hosed um because you, know, you couldn't meet compliance requirements you might have on your business so that's what i've typically seen in the past but uh, i don't know specifically in the google world uh, that use case so I couldn't tell from the article whether that those local users on the database also are represented as, as entities in IAM for that. Because that's it was a little you know, it was a little vague on that. A little vague, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I think they could have been clearer on that. Uh, it was like this: like we really don't want you to do this thing, but we will tell you this way we will help you do the other thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, yeah, so you can specify these passwords and things uh, in the console to build them, but I don't think it leverages IAM to integrate them. Yeah. Because it would be handy to sort of manage that all, all in one place, and then you know using Cloud SQL sort of to manage that, that bridge between the two, right? Like keep my database users in sync for what I've defined in my I am. Yep, that would be neat. That yeah, be cool. I suspect probably not. I think this is if it really is about addressing legacy concerns, then it's it's the people with scripts in Notepad copying and pasting that creates creates users and access to databases and things. Old inst- old software installers that assume you have a super user account and then create service accounts. When you install something, so it's yeah, it's probably not. It would be nice to, to kind of get the information back out and make it visible in as part of IAM. But yeah, it's not um, not quite so. But you authen- the the sure. press release is that you authenticate against the IAM for those local database users. So I'm, I'm yeah, I'm just sort of like eh, I misunder I, and I'm sure that I'm missing part of this because I don't use it directly. Yeah, maybe I'll figure it out soon. Well, last year, Google... Oh, sorry, go ahead, John. I was going to say, he's not angry enough to figure it out yet. <laughs> <laughs> or, or frustrated. Yeah, someday he'll have to figure it out. Not yeah. today. If I ever rotated passwords, then it'd be a problem. But that's, set it, forget it, yo. Yeah. What's password <laughs> rotation for? <laughs> One, know. two, three, four, just like my luggage. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, last year, Google released EventArc, a unified eventing platform with 90-plus sources of events from the Google Cloud. Uh, Google recognized that customers use a ton of platforms to run their businesses, though, uh, from internal IT systems to hosted vendor software and SaaS services. Uh, creating and maintaining integration between these platforms is time-consuming and complex, And with but now with third-party sources in EventArc, adding integration between supported SaaS platforms and your app will be easier than ever. They're announcing the new preview of third-party sources in EventArc with the first cohort of sources providing ecosystem uh, capabilities. This capability is made to be easy to discover and set up, provide fully managed event infrastructure, consistency, ability to trigger several third-party source triggers, and built-in filtering of events. And the first four vendors that they partnered with was Datadog, ForgeRock, Lacework, and CloudGuard, with many more coming soon. And so basically, the scenario here is that you have something like Datadog that detects that you are running out of disk space, and perhaps you want to automatically expend your disk to not run out of disk space. So that event will come into the event arc, and then you can have that fire off a service or a function, uh, and that function would then call the API and extend that drive before you get paged, uh, which might be pretty nice until you run out of space or past the two terabyte limit. So that's uh, you know, there are some limitations to these things, but the, these are the type of integrations you're looking to get. Uh, or vice versa, you want your Google data to go to one of these third-party services. Uh, these ones in particular don't probably have that directional need, but uh, you know if you want to go to a pager duty or you want to go something else like that, you could now do that through Event Arc potentially as well in the future. Yeah, this is very handy for yeah, moving a step in automations that how many people have built time after time, right? The the auto scaling 
by, you know, triggered from a, a monitoring metric. And, and then, yeah, if you're outside of, you know, the, the Google ecosystem for monitoring and you're, you're integrated with Datadog, perhaps you have, you know, other resources that are in a data center somewhere and you want a single pane of glass, you know, you've been sort of having to cobble it together forever. And so this is nice for those, those users to just put it all in one place and be able to leverage it in a, and then also in, you know, event driven instead of polling. So that's awesome. Yep. I like events. That's the way to go. Mm-hmm. Let's move on to Azure, uh, who has a very strange press release today. <laughs> Uh, general availability of US West 3 price adjustment. It came out on August 1st. Uh, and this press release is literally one sentence. Uh, and it says, as part of Azure's commitment to delivering the best possible value for Azure customers, they're announcing a price reduction in US West 3, effective August 1st. Uh, but they don't tell you what you're getting a reduction on or why or anything about this. So uh, I did ask in the FinOps Foundation Slack if anyone else knew what the discount actually was on. Uh, or maybe this is just a press release and error, but I did find it funny because uh, you either get a nice surprise at the end of the month when your bill is a little lower for something you didn't know was going to be lower, or uh, this is just fun to make fun of Azure for sending a terrible press release <laughs> that they have not deleted yet. Yeah. yeah, either someone is going on vacation and this was the last item on the to-do list, or, or you know, you leave you leave my brain open to interpret what the any kind of ambiguity that is around this, like. Clearly, there's a nefarious, you know, means here, which is they're trying to cover their butts for some sort of, you know, thing they did in US West three. So they're giving us all a price reduction, so you know, backdated at a specific date, so they can say, oh, we we did this other thing, no, no liability here. Yeah, you know, I think it's because uh, you know you, you look at the list of locations and you think, you know, Virginia. I know where Virginia is. I know where I know where Oregon is. I know all these places. And then, then you look at US West three for Azure, and it's El Mirage, Arizona. And you think, well, on earth that? I don't want to put my workloads in the butt crack of uh, of America. And so maybe they're just sort of encouraging people to go and use that data center over over the sort of more popular, <laughs> well known locations. <laughs> that, that would be pretty funny, actually. Like no one's using this one region. We've put all this money into it. I know. Cut the price. Which one is uh, Which one is US West three? Uh, oh, El Mirage, Arizona. Yeah, who puts their servers in Arizona? I never understood that as a data center location either. Like, why is COVID in the hottest place in the country? It's a great place where AC is super expensive. I've never understood data centers in Las Vegas, Arizona, or Texas. I just don't get it. Well, I mean, there are some benefits to them. Like, they don't, they're typically not a hurricane zone there. It's not a very active earthquake fault. Uh, so it has everything going forward except for the temperature. <laughs> Uh, and with like Hoover Dam, had easy access to power. Although that's not going out so well now with like me drying up. But uh, you know, there, there was be- there was reasons. It's just mm-hmm. those reasons are you know a little sketchy at this point. <laughs> so I, mean, I guess the sun gets you solar power, though. So maybe maybe it is a green option. I just I haven't thought of it from that perspective. Oh yeah, I mean if they you're right. I suppose if you did it that way, then it doesn't matter if you're burning a lot of energy for generating a lot of energy. That's nu- they use nuclear power down there. They got a the Salt River project to have a big ass nuclear reactor. Which is funny because when I used to live there, they used to put the prices up in the summer because you know of uh, the cost of resources. I'm like, but the resources don't go up in su- in summer. It's just nuclear fuel. It's the same year round. It's like <laughs> price. Just a way to just yeah. way to charge you for air conditioning. That's all. Yeah, you you don't want to not pay for. It. Uh, well, you still have to bring up and down. Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> well, you had to move the you had to move the rods up and down to the machine. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's yeah. like oh. Nerd out into like you know managing electrical capacity for a region. Wrong podcast. There's, there's another rat hole for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cass is going to spend three hours looking at that now. <laughs> yeah. All right, and then uh, Microsoft is releasing two new security products from their acquisition of Risk IQ a year ago. First up is the new Microsoft Defender Threat Intelligence. This product helps SecOps teams uncover attack infrastructure and accelerate investigation and remediation with more context, insights, and analysis than ever before. Microsoft's while threat intelligence is built into their products like Sentinel, customers need direct access to real-time data and Microsoft's unmatched signal to hunt for threats across environments proactively. And the second new feature is Microsoft Defender External Attack Surface Management. Ooh, that's a mouthful. Gives security teams the ability to discover unknown and unmanaged resources that are visible and accessible from the internet, essentially the same view an attacker has when selecting their target. Defender External Attack Surface Management helps customers discover unmanaged resources that could be potentially entry points for an attacker. I mean, I'd much rather Azure be polling that than 
you know, an internal security team or a security vendor that's hired or, you know, a malicious t- attacker, obviously, um, you know, just cause it is a, you know, I don't know what the, you know, what the value is for security purposes, but it's a really great way to clean up your environment. Cause that one thing that's still out there that you don't know what it is, it's, it's going to show up on that list cause it's not patched and still doing TLS two or whatever. Yeah. That's fair. And then our final story is the Azure Firewall Premium is now IXA Lab Certified. They're putting your premium dollars to work by paying IXA to certify their premium firewall. The new IPS certification from IXA Labs is an important IPS certification and is additive to their existing firewall capabilities. Not only do they have this terrible premium thing, they also said Azure Firewall Premium SKU to set Jonathan off, which is a managed cloud-based network security service that protects your Azure virtual network resources. It provides advanced threat protection that meets the needs of highly sensitive and regulated environments that include IPS and TLS inspection capabilities. Ixa Labs provides credible third-party testing and certification of security and health IT products, as well as a network-connected devices. This includes certification of network intrusion prevention systems like the Azure Firewall product. There better be a sticker. Oh, yeah. I guess it's important because um, to do work with the federal government, you would need to have those those uh, security devices authorized. And I think Ixa is one of the few vendors which are authorized to actually provide accreditation for things like that. So it's probably a, a necessity in terms of doing business with the military or government entities. That's, I, I think it's good to know. Uh, and so, yeah, if you need that certification to do government work, you are good to go. <laughs> All right, let's take us to the lightning round. Uh, we are doing round robin again once a day, and again because Peter's not here to score us. So, Jonathan, I put you first because I'm mean like that. So. Ah, curses! You, you know that was going to be my best one too. <laughs> <laughs> Announcing the general availability next top IP support for Azure Root Server. All that comes to mind is let's do the hop, let's do the bunny hop. <laughs> <Song>. <laughs> You would think that an Azure route server would know hops. I just, you know, it seems like it would have been part of the product to get day one, but apparently not. Yeah. The kangaroos would be very happy. I got nothing because I, I, apparently I'm just, you know, have too much free time because um, I went down the rabbit hole on this one too. And I'm like, what is this? Why would you do this? And then, <laughs> I was expecting some kind of IPA joke about hops, but no. You oh, sure. this <laughs> opportunity. You're right. Oh, I failed. <laughs> should lose a point for that. Generally available, Azure public IPv6 offerings are free as of July 31st. Huh, you couldn't monetize a bajillion email, uh, IP addresses into an offering on Azure? Hmm, so strange. <laughs> yeah. AWS Support launches a new AWS Support Center console domain. What? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I don't know what it was before, but now it's support.console.aws.amazon.com, which I will still not remember because that's way too many words put together. Oh, Why couldn't nice. it just be aws.amazon.com slash support? Wouldn't that be more more usable? Just I'd like to think it's because if they have uh, service failures by having it in its own domain, they can isolate that fault and you can still have access to the support center, even if uh, they have some other underlying services. I mean, unless have. it's hosted on GCP, I don't know that I buy that argument, but okay. <laughs> general availability reservation administrator and reader roles in the azure portal which makes me one like i always think about roles in terms of like my job role and i know that this is like a least privileged role for reservation administrator but i just have this dream of like my job is reservation administrator that's all i do i make reservations that's what i want to do go azure cloud reservations thank you I have a lot I mean, of reservations about using the Azure <laughs> portal. <laughs> well, that's true too. I have that as well. But uh, you know. yeah. Now in preview, Amazon Workspaces integration with SAML 2.0. So you mean the thing where we had to like integrate the single sign-on with Okta to the workspaces, but it didn't actually integrate properly. So you had to remember that the password was not actually the password, but it was the two-factor code. We don't have to do that anymore. Is that what you're saying? Mm-hmm. No, you probably still have to do that. No, oh, okay. It's just well, now then, it's integrated. Screw you, Amazon <laughs> Workspaces. <laughs> yeah. Amazon RDS for MySQL now supports enforcing SSL TLS connections. <laughs> Encrypt everything except for when you can't do it because the product doesn't support it. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> 
AWS microservice extractor for .NET now provides automated refactoring recommendations. The only recommendation I can give you is get off .NET. Yeah. Yeah. Extract yeah. this microservice into the trash can. Yeah. Yes. The answer is yes, definitely. VM import export now supports Windows 11. Which if you're importing your Windows 11 workspaces into AWS as a server platform, I don't know what you're doing and I don't want to know. And please don't write me. <laughs> they Whoever's doing that probably doesn't want to be doing that, right? Like that's that that one I like server. Hope that. I like to have yeah. that dream of like <laughs> this guy knows this is terrible and it's the most horrendous thing he could possibly do, but it's the only way he can get this thing to to Azure or to sorry, AWS in this case. Uh you know, and so they, they built this free to feature for that guy. But I like just you could have quit. I mean, you didn't have yeah. to do this job. You could have just resigned. It would have been a better choice. Or, you know, learn re- reverse engineer the app and put it on something modern. Well, GovCloud is usually the last region to get any support for anything new, and and to see GovCloud in the in the announcement for a new service or new you know new feature like this <laughs> tells me that mm. we know we know we know mm. who asked for this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. Curses! There goes my theory. I was hoping it was someone that was like only logging in through an incognito window because they felt dirty. But I did like the the only region that's excluded from this is Jakarta. Normally, China that's excluded. No, it's Jakarta because they don't allow Windows 11 in there. I don't I don't know what that one's about. <laughs> AWS Ground Station announces a new antenna location in the Asia Pacific, Singapore region. The tumbleweed rolls through the club. <laughs> Earth to Major Tom. Earth to yeah. Major Tom. <laughs> 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 we probably should have edited these before we got to the show. <laughs> yeah, that, that one we could have dropped, I suppose. Yeah. Or at least made a contact joke. <laughs> For and sure. finally, AWS Secrets Manager Connections now support the latest hybrid post quantum TLS with Kyber. Kyber crystals? Skywars. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, not Psych, as we found out today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, bad day for Psych. Blown away by a single processor. So sad. Yeah, that literally, look, we've got this best post quantum algorithm. Actually, no, we don't. Psych. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I was, I was when I when it came out, I was like, wait, didn't we just talk about that from Google? I mean, that was bike, and you had told me that I had typoed psych when I put bike into the show notes, which we laughed about, and now uh, psych was all along the the fraud and the whole deal. It wasn't me. It was psych. Yep. Uh, and the winner is <laughs> no one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, the winners whoever is starting to use post quantum as a thing. Quiet you. I always think of dishwasher tablets. I say post quantum TLS. I'm like, what is <laughs> what is my dishwasher need encryption for? <laughs> All right. Well, that was fun. Uh, things coming up in the cloud once again. VMworld August 29th through September 1st. Uh, for all your people in the VMware world, you'll probably hear about cloud. Is my guess and how they can help you move to the cloud faster uh, with their solutions. And then of course we have the Microsoft Power Platform Conference coming up 918 through the 22nd, and then Google Cloud Next October 11th through 13th, which is going to be virtual once again this year. And then Oracle Cloud World in Las Vegas October 17th through the 20th. All good things coming up very quickly. Uh, I would like maybe go to this DevOps Enterprise Summit that's also in Vegas, uh, but then it's at the same time as the Oracle Conference. And like, do I really want to cross pollinate DevOps with Oracle? That just seems like a bad call. So I don't know. I haven't decided what I'm going to do about that, but uh, we'll see as we go along the path. And that's another fantastic week here in the cloud. See you later. Bye, everybody. And that is the week in cloud. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Foghorn Consulting. Subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and tweet us your feedback at hashtag thecloudpod. Or join our Slack channel, go to our website, thecloudpod.net, for sign-up instructions. So did you guys uh, you guys see Sundar's uh, desire to have a simplicity sprint? To gather employee feedback on efficiency at Google, did you guys see this article from CNBC? No, I didn't. Yeah, should have scrolled down. I, 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 I kind of feel like it's just a uh, an underhanded way of scaring people into working extra hours or, or risk face losing their jobs. Honestly, yeah, it's a little weird. Uh, so, you know, some key points from the article here from CNBC. Uh, you know, Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Google, basically announced to employees that a new effort called Simplicity Sprint which was listed ideas from more than from its 174,000 employees on where to focus and improve efficiency. 
the CEO says Google's productivity as a company isn't where it needs to be to given the headcount that it has and warned of a toughening economy. And then HR chief Fiona Sicagoni said, also acknowledged the industry wide concerns about layoffs and said the company is not currently looking to reduce Google's overall workforce, but reiterated the need for greater efficiency and focus. So these uh, simplicity sprints is an effort to improve efficiency and improve employee focus during an uncertain economic climate. Uh, so they're basically looking, asking people to go tell us we're inefficient as a business and then help you uh, address those deficiencies with your, I guess, your free time, right? Your your 20% time. Go fix the inefficiencies in the business or else we're going to lay people off. That's how, that's how it feels. It feels like a threat. It does. Yeah. It's oddly timed, right? Like it's, you know, want to clarify some things after our earning statement, you know, so that's going to put you on edge. And then it's like, yeah, our productivity as a whole is not where it needs to be for the uncertain future ahead. Like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> guess I'll fix my resume. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, and the fact that it makes the news, and the fact that this this type of review and an employee input into into process and process improvement isn't an ongoing thing anyway. Like, why is it a one off? Like, why isn't this something that happens all the time? Well, I mean, I also if there's you know uncertainty ahead, I don't want my CEO to crowdsource the company strategy to get to navigate it. So I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think as a CEO, it's hard to see the inefficiencies in your business, right? Because everyone's giving you the story you sort of want to hear, uh, and then you have to basically call bullshit on that through KPIs. But um, yeah, I, I think in this case, they're looking maybe there's ideas on the lowest levels of like, hey, you know, if we fix the way we do X thing, it can make us more efficient by ten percent or. You know, maybe if we change the way we do recruiting, it could be better. Or the way we launch new services. Like, there's all kinds of things they could do that potentially increase efficiency and make them more profitable. Uh, you know, it's also interesting too, in light of the earnings, where you know Google Cloud was still not making a profit, and they were still making a very large gap in that profitability. So, uh, you know, I, I wonder if they're looking for like how do we make Google Cloud more efficient as part of the conversation, <laughs> but. Uh, Apparently, they're going to be select, collecting ideas through August fifteenth. So, I'm curious to see if they announce what the what their people came up with as uh, efficiency items, or they're going to come out on August fifteenth and say, "Well, we didn't get enough efficiencies in the business, so we're just going to lay a bunch of people off." Yeah. yeah so. I mean, how does he quantify what the productivity should be? How, yeah, how, that's how, a good how, question. How, I, I don't. This? I think it's. I think it's a little branding. You know, it's yeah, just. A, I think maybe. It's just a list. <laughs> is it a reasonable delta? I mean, it's been a it's been a stressful couple of years. It's been a huge upheaval in the economy and in people's lives. It's understandable. I mean, working from home is certainly a challenge to begin with. Although we've seen people working from home very efficiently, perhaps even more so than working for an office. So I, I don't know. Well, it might be tied to the KPIs around uh, you know uh, revenue per employee or something they're expecting. And so they're saying, you know, if we look at our company when we were 120,000 employees per se, we were getting this efficiency out of our employees, this much revenue out of them per, on a per headcount basis. But since we've gone to 174,000, we're not getting that efficiency that we think we should be on a headcount basis. So maybe that's part of it. And that's what they're thinking. That's how they baseline the fact they're not getting what they should get out of the workforce. But I also think the type of employees you hire as you get in, I mean, like how many campuses do they have down in Mountain View? I mean, like we've, I visited a few now because I'm a Google Cloud customer now. And I've been to their campus. I've been to the new Google Bay buildings. I mean, like these are massive buildings with people who are not using them. <laughs> I mean, I like, guess they have some people coming in. They're forcing some people to come back to the office, but like a lot of money was spent on these buildings. Like that's that's a huge drag, and you have to have people to maintain them, janitor, tarot services. You have to have front desk people. You have to have food services in all these buildings. You have to have, you know, those are not revenue generating positions. Yeah, that's fair. And I guess something that's on my mind as well is they're not building the easy services anymore. You know, they're not building things which are simple. They're building more and more complex things which integrate with more and more services. Uh, I think it's reasonable that velocity slows down as sort of the level of level of effort or the complexity of the things they're building goes up. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, you know, as Amazon spent years building building blocks, and now they just finally, in the last four years, started building higher level platform services with those building blocks. You know, we talked about why GCP doesn't have as many of those yet. And I think it's because they're still building building blocks in some ways. But when you look at their more mature businesses, ads, YouTube, you know, YouTube's under threat from TikTok. So that's a, that's a competitive threat they have. And then you have things like ads, which are going to be always impacted by a, a downturn or a recession because people are going to spend back, pull back on ad spend. So it's going to be interesting to see, you know, what they come out with this. If there's a really a magic bullet in efficiency to fix their problems at Google, 
I think their culture has gotten bogged down in a lot of politics too. I mean, that, the fact that this gets leaked is a perfect example of it. Like, you know, oh my God, this is a, a veiled threat and it got leaked to the press. Like, why did th- this isn't something I would think to leak to the press? <laughs> you know, we had the AI guy we talked about two weeks, you know, last week, uh, and him getting fired for thinking their AI was sentient. Uh, you know, they've had other black eyes politically, you know, in the last couple of years as well through the pandemic where, you know, and they're forcing people back to work with people don't want to do. So just overall, the optics around Google are kind of murky. Yeah, it's a little disingenuous. It's, you know, so apart from not making you come back to the office and apart from not giving you the pay raises that which, which you expected or, or deserve, and apart from all these other things that you asked for and didn't get, what else can we do? Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it definitely has, like, the telltale marks of my – you know, the early days or of, of my Yahoo tenure in the early 2000s, like it's the same sort of scrutiny from the press and everything is, everything is leaked and everything's publicized. And, you know, it, there's no good news making that loop. It's only mm-hmm. criticisms and, and, and that, and so it's, it, you know, it weighs on you as an employee, it kind of sucks, you know, whether or not you're getting, you know, you know, treated fairly by Google or not, as your employer, you know, just having it mentioned, having that be the topic of conversation in social circles is sort of not that fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, I you know you people say, Oh, I work at Yahoo. They're like, Oh my God, isn't it, isn't it a terrible place oh, to yeah. work right now? And you're like, well, not for my job. Oh, that's the worst. Yeah. That was the worst. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, we, we, we didn't talk about it as a post-show, uh, but you and I talked about it a little bit on Slack. It was, uh, you know, the meta article that came out last week and they were comp- like meta is going through its Yahoo phase. And it's like, mm-hmm. what does that mean? <laughs> Uh, and, you know, they're trying to make this big, massive business pe- pivot to the metaverse and that's not going well for them. And they're under social attack uh, on the Facebook and Instagram side from TikTok and these other players that are, you know, the youngins want to go use instead. And uh, it was an interesting uh, article about, you know, this transition is not going well. They don't really have a plan. They don't have a product that's amazing and going to drive revenue in a big way. And can they actually make the transition or do they end up becoming the next Yahoo? And I mean, all the all the signs are there that they could. I just don't know if they will or not. I think it's a sign when companies just get too big, you know, that and their you know their success is largely built on being very agile and opportunistic. And then once they get too big, and you know, there's it's really hard to be agile with that many you know things involved and that many people that are that are affected by a business decision. So. Then you have competing interests where like, no, we should be, you know, we should be a metaverse company or we should be a social media, you know, content company and not everyone's going to agree. Yep. All right. We'll talk to you guys next week. See you later. Bye.